retail stores, um, special order, and now it will be online. But, yes, we would love to have an opportunity to do something with a big box store um, and other uh, online dealers as well. And how has North Carolina been in terms of, like, um, their rules and regulations in terms of trying to get a liquor company going and running on a full basis? Because I understand that regulations here can be a little bit uh, draconian compared to other states. We'll put it that way. Yeah, I mean, North Carolina is one of the control states, and so the only way that you can sell liquor is through the ABC stores. And so we've really, you know, fortunately so many of us either attended school here or are from here and have deep, deep roots here or live here now. And so because of that, we've been able to really get the word out at uh, different events about the availability of the product at those ABC stores. And so it is tough. It is definitely tough. But we've, we've been fortunate. We, we would love to be able to move to being available full-time on the shelf, and we just need a little bit more demand, and we'll be able to go from being special order to, to being available every day on the shelf. And one of the other things that I think people are not aware about is the actual deep history that exists even within, well, definitely within North Carolina, you know, tied in with the liquor companies and, of course, NASCAR and things of that nature, but also tied in to just the African-American community because I think a lot of people don't realize that or they forget about the fact that a lot of times people from our community were the ones that were running the alcohol, and basically that's how both NASCAR and the liquor business kind of, like, got started at almost the same time. But I think a lot of times people forget the history behind um particularly the liquor industry, but even all the alcohols, but definitely the liquor right. and spirit industry. Right. Well, and actually, if, if it's possible to join on Kelvin and Ralph and Sean, because I think they're probably on now as well. I'm sure that one of um, one or multiple of them can talk to um, even more of that history than I can. But I will say, you know, yes, being from Charlotte and having actually worked um, – on several projects in the NASCAR industry, you know, there are a couple of great movies out there that really talk about um, the distribution of whiskey and, and moonshine through those uh, drivers who, you know, eventually that led to the whole NASCAR racing industry. But as we all know, I mean, we've all had uncles or grandfathers or somebody who was making their own special homebrew. In fact, I was at someone's home just yesterday and, uh, they they had a little special brew of their own that they had for us to sample, and it was just really because of um, the expertise of really Kelvin and Gary. I, I'd say Ralph and Sean and Pont, um, while they certainly are connoisseurs, they were more tasters than they were product development people. But um, they really were able to bring in through. I mean, if Gary is practically a chef, and so they really know about bringing in flavors. Um, that would really complement the, the straight corn whiskey that we have. Um, but there, as you, you may have heard, it was really an African-American um, gentleman who worked for Jack Daniels who developed the Jack Daniels formula, and that's something that really came out um, just a few years ago. So you're right. There's been a long history in our community um, with African-Americans in creating um, cotton, uh, you know, alcoholic beverages, and we're just excited to be part of that, this whole a resurgence of making those available more broadly to, our, to not just to our community. We've actually had great response from all different types of people who are, are who quite frankly, just love the product. I mean, it's, it's still moon. It's the corn whiskey moonshine. It, it is delicious. We have um, our our special reserve, and then we also have an apple flavor, and we'll be soon coming out with a couple of other really exciting versions that we know people will love even more. Um, but actually, no, we'll be able to bring in Ralph and Kelvin and Sean. Are they on the line? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Dean, can you get Ralph and uh, Kelvin on if you've got them on the line too? And, and I got Sean, Kelvin I right here. Sean's already in. I think he has his phone on mute. Kelvin, yeah, welcome to Straight Talk. Here. You're on the line. Thanks for having yeah, us, see, guys. I, we really do I appreciate it. Too much, so I, I'm going to let them do some talking now. <laughs> no, no Gail, you, Gail, Gail. You've doing, uh, Gail, you've been doing a fantastic, doing a fantastic job as always. <laughs> so, Kelvin, okay. tell us how did you get involved in the business? I believe I met you uh, along with Ralph at one of the events at Hey Tide that Spectacular Magazine was doing. But I was just wondering how you could give us your own personal story 
that's how you got involved. And I was just going to share because when we had um, we had one other liquor company on this show before, and that was Southern Wicked, a young lady out of I think she's out of Raleigh, but she might have gone to Carolina. Um, T. Naomi Lucas that started that company sometime back, and I remember telling her that I remember that when my great uncle, well, one of my great uncles, of course, you have multiple great uncles and different great relatives, but one of them made his, like she said, made their own homemade brew. And I remember I had a friend that came into town. Um, I was, you know, I'll tell on myself. I was kind of trying to flirt with her. She was from Texas. I invited her to the house. Uh, she was basically ignoring my family. And I don't think she was really feeling any sort of love connection. So she was ignoring me and ignoring my family and doing the whole crochet thing. But when my great uncle, uh, God rest his soul, brought out his lion's brew, um, lion's farm, because he had the same thing like the, name of the famous wine, but it, he spelled it with his family name and everything. And she all of a sudden did a 100% switch because she sat there and got real sociable after she had been non-sociable for a while at the family outing. And I remember as she was leaving, going back to Texas, and I was really glad to get her on out of back to home since it wasn't anything happening in our side of connection and everything. But I remember her looking back at me, and this was many years ago, talking about, like, can you be sure to send your, uh, your, your uncle to send me some – of that liquor back, and I'm sitting there going like, uh, homegirl, I didn't like you that much, and I don't know if we're going to do that because you just kind of like pissed me and my family off. So you just go on. You're not getting any lion farm. That is that is funny. Well, you know, the, I think the thing that, that got me interested in it, we, we have always consumed, I told, I told the story of when, we, when we first met, we have always consumed moonshine. And uh, in part, we got really creative with it when we were in college and it just grew from there in terms of the types of recipes that Gary would come up and, you know, I call Gary the mad scientist and, and I'm sort of the perfectionist in terms of the flavors. And so what's happened is over a period of time, wherever we went, it was that social part that always came up. One moonshine is so iconic that everybody has a backstory, just like you told your story, Gail told hers. But there's always a story about moonshine and that's one of the great things about it, that it's, it's a part of that American fiber fabric, excuse me, already. And so all we did was just build on that. And so everywhere we went, we told the story because we always get a reaction when we go to whiskey festivals or attend whiskey events and we say that we're in the moonshine business selling 100% corn whiskey. Everybody always asks, well, you know, they, oh, they'll give you a facial expression like, whoa, had that, nah. But we always tell people that this is the evolution of moonshine. This is the, the most premium product that's on the marketplace right now. And so we've had a chance to go up against all the competitors, and we've won. And so really for us, it was about bringing a product to the marketplace that, one, looked like it was a premium product. If you look at our bottle, it's not in a, a mason jar. It's in a, it's in a whiskey bottle. The label, everything screams premium, and, and the taste itself puts you over the top. So everybody sort of gets a little scared at first. They have that taste, and they automatically sort of sink back and say, whoa, and get surprised by it. And so we've just built off of that everywhere we've gone in terms of relationships and having that conversation and introducing the product. And it's worked for us. It really has. It, it's opened a lot of doors for us. But we took something that we used to sort of sell amongst ourselves, enjoy amongst ourselves, took it to different events, and everybody kept asking for it. And so eventually we said, you know, why not put it in the marketplace? And so we, we and took back to the product. How, how would, and how would you define moonshine? Because that's something that I'm always – fascinated by because like I said, you know, the, there's the stereotypical images. There's the people that think of moonshine as like the old steel back in the backwoods. You know, they remember the old episode of Beverly uh, Hillbillies yep. and some of those Beverly people that were yep. doing that and Dukes of Hazard and that imagery. And then there's the people that remember, like you said, the homemade versions of uh, people experimenting with different fruits and different things of that nature. And then there's the more, uh, I call it kind of like the mashup version of what some people make consider moonshine as well. Because I remember when I went to college and I did not go to an HBCU, I went to Marquette in Milwaukee, there was a couple of parties that I went to where basically it was just a mix of any liquor that you could get and you just kind of all threw it together. And some people might consider that moonshine, but, you know, it was definitely toxic because there was no doubt that, you know, you were not, you probably only have half a sip because you had probably about 100, like, well, maybe not 100, but anywhere from 7 to 12 different liquors. And I don't even want to know what the proof was. I'm sure that if somebody had dropped a cigarette, those domes would have been blown up. Hey, well, Mark, you know, true. I just want to speak go, go, to that for a second. Yeah, As go someone ahead. someone who previously really had no interest in whiskey, 
and definitely no interest in moonshine. A lot of it had to do with the fact that they were so harsh and they were, as you said, a very, you know, unrefined, generally mix of, of various um, grain spirits. And so what's really special about our product is that it is 100% corn. And so if you think about the best fresh corn you've ever had and that the, the fact that when you get a really good ear of corn, I mean, that corn has a crispness to it, a sweetness to it, and that's what we have. Our, that, our product, from the very first time that I tasted it to, to today, I mean, what really stands out is that you really get this clean, crisp flavor, and instead of a burn, it's more of a warm, smooth mouthfeel. I mean, it's really enjoyable. I mean, it's not, it's not something harsh, and what's really been exciting to us is that, you know, in the past, whiskeys have really, and, have, and especially moonshine, um, because of that harshness, because of that burn, because of that alcohol content, it's been something that's been of more interest to uh, the men. But quite frankly, we have as many, if not more, women followers as we do male followers because it really is a smooth and and clean experience, and it, it is perfect for cocktails. So we have a lot of restaurants and bars, um, very high-end bars that, uh, in, in fact, you know, we're in Ruth Chris all over Indiana, um, and a lot of hotels have picked us up because it's great. For making cocktails. So instead of using a vodka um, or, you know, gin, it, it, is, it is great to use our product as the primary mixer, and it's that versatility um, that's made our special reserve of such interest to uh, the different restaurants and, and bars. So I'm sorry, Kelly. Wow. Well, I promise. No, no problem. No, no problem. No, 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 before no. I get back to the guys and everything, Allison, um, I was just wondering, have you ever – had any clients that were involved in the liquor business or anything of that nature, if you're still with me? And uh, have you had any uh, folks that have been tied into this field as well? No, but we like liquor. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just was on your website. It's it's beautiful. Um, it's beautiful. Uh, no, we, we haven't. We're actually trying. We do a lot of B2B, and we're really trying to get into more of consumer products. Um, so, I think that what you're doing, you're doing a great job. You obviously have your experience in branding and marketing, and I think everything you're doing is spot on. Um, I would check out Haro, like we I mentioned earlier, to see if there's any opportunities mm-hmm. for you. I think something just on the PR side is, you know, you like holidays, um, you know, top Father's Day gifts, great, you know, holiday gifts for that, a different type of gift ideas. A lot of the media, like the uh, magazines, will start planning out, at, like, three to four months out. So September is when you may want to pitch the national media, you know, in, industry related and like wherever your target market is for those holiday gift stories. So that's something that you may want to just, you know, keep in mind. But I think that you're doing a great job. And, and if you can well, get into some stores, that would be amazing. Yeah. Well, no, we'd love to chat with you. Uh, I don't, I, I didn't hear your contact information at the beginning, but I'm sure we can get that from Mark, and um, we'd love to chat with you. Sure. And, yeah, and that's absolutely. one of the things I was going to get, Allison, if you would give that contact information, because we've also heard Drink Still Moon, their website, but if you would give yours as well. Sure. It's it's AllisonMayPR.com, so Allison with one L, so A-L-I-S-O-N-M-A-Y-P-R.com, and that's our website, and then you can just connect with me right there, and I'm on social media all over the place, same thing, Allison May PR. Excellent. We will do that. Yeah. Sounds good. That's one of the things we love doing is making those connections and everything. <laughs> so, Kelvin, <laughs> come back and tell us how you were, uh, your involvement and what got you involved. That's where we were going with your own personal involvement. Well, my own personal involvement, again, was, was based on what I grew up with personally from, you know, whether it was Moonshine from, from Roxboro or Statesville or some of the uh, other counties in the the state of North Carolina, but all my uh, fraternity brothers, i.e. Gary and Sean and Ponce, we all consumed it during during undergraduate. And so we kind of grew up with it, obviously, because it was always around us. And so when we got a chance to really be connoisseurs of it is when we started perfecting different recipes and and, and doing them at, whether it was homecoming or some of the events and parties that we would have. And so we got so good at it, to be quite honest, 
with those recipes is that people started asking for it all the time. And so we always tell 